the Man of Tomorrow, Kal-El, the last son of Krypton, Superman, the Man of Steel. After 75 years and thousands of comics, the character isn't just a comic book hero, but an icon. Born from the minds of creators Jerry Siegel and Joe Shuster in Cleveland, Ohio back in 1933, the character has gone on to legendary status, not just in America, but around the world. While there were other heroes that predated him, like the Shadow and the Lone Ranger, Superman was truly the first superhero. If not for his creation, one could argue that many of today's popular characters either wouldn't exist or would be something else entirely. Beyond the comics, Superman has been featured in everything from cartoons to video games and has been the focus of numerous ongoing TV shows. In 1978, Superman the movie was released. Directed by Richard Donner, it was the first big-budget superhero movie. Originally, the plan was to shoot Superman 1 and 2 simultaneously, which they did until some major disagreements between the producers and director. Superman 2 is about 80% done when the producers decided they had already spent enough money on the film and wanted him to just finish the first one. When the movie was released, it was both a critical and financial success, raking in over $300 million in its theatrical run. Fans and mainstream audiences loved it. Critics praised it, and it was nominated for three Academy Awards. Richard Donner left the production, and the studio brought in Richard Lester to finish Superman 2. Since a few elements intended for 2 were used in Superman 1, such as the ending, which was originally supposed to be the end for 2, the script had to be changed and new scenes were shot. Superman 2 was released in 1980, and even though the cast wasn't entirely happy with it, it went on to be another hit. While 1 and 2 were loved, 3 took a nosedive. The first script brought in the infamous villains Brainiac and Mr. Mixie's Plitlick. The studio decided it was a better idea to make the film more of a comedy, so they brought in Richard Pryor, who is a hilarious comedian, but his talents were wasted here. They did include some parts from the original script, like Brainiac, only now he was diminished to just an evil computer. Although the part where the computer turns a woman into this thing was responsible for many kids' nightmares. In 1987, Superman 4 is released, and it was such a flop, it halted the franchise. The series went through various levels of development hell, as Warner Brothers tried to find the right way to bring back the character. Finally, in 2006, they released Superman Returns, which was directed by Brian Singer. He had just worked wonders with X-Men 1 and 2, so they were expecting great things. The movie picked up right where 2 left off, and ignored 3 and 4 completely, which was a wise move. They brought in Brandon Routh, who did a great job in impersonating Christopher Reeve's iconic performance. While it was financially successful, making close to $400 million against its $209 million budget, the studio wasn't happy. The series is once again put on hold. After seeing the successful reboot of Batman, which came out the year before, Warner Brothers decides that maybe a full Superman reboot is in order. In 2008, Warner Brothers starts talking to various comic book writers and directors for ideas on how to restart such a well-known character. After talking to David S. Goyer, who wrote Batman Begins and The Dark Knight, they decided the best approach would be to reintroduce the character in current times. While in the 78th Superman, the character was seen as a flying red and blue Boy Scout that was beloved almost instantly by the people of Earth. For the new version, they tried to come at it from a more realistic perspective. If this guy from another planet with incredible powers shows up on Earth all of a sudden, people would be afraid. They aren't going to come at him with open arms. With the concept ready, they decided to look for a director. While everyone from Darren Aronofsky to Guillermo del Toro were considered, they eventually agreed on Zack Snyder. Going back a few years to his first production, the remake of Dawn of the Dead, Snyder had done the impossible. He took a beloved classic and remade it in a way that makes it its own movie by using elements from the original, but telling a completely different story. Even the most jaded diehard fans of the original had a hard time disliking the remake. Then comes the monstrous box office hit 300. The movie was an adaptation of the Frank Miller comic, and it wowed audiences with its stylized look and awesome action sequences. His next film was Watchmen, an adaptation of the amazing Alan Moore graphic novel. He did the impossible again by taking a comic that many considered unfilmable and made a solid movie out of it. In an odd move, he followed that up with a computer-animated film, Legend of the Guardians, The Owls of Gahul. While initially written off as another Talking Animals movie, audiences found a beautiful and very mature tale. Next up is Sucker Punch. Initially, audiences were excited over the amazing visuals of the film and what appeared to be a heavy anime influence. Then something weird happened. The movies released and not only did it underperform, it was labeled as off-putting male sexist fantasy drivel that was exploitative towards women. Even though it's not, 
it's really a movie about empowerment. The fact that most people see girls flouncing around in cute outfits and short skirts and assume the plot is completely secondary are missing the point. The point is that the girls, all of them from Baby Doll to Rocket, are owning their attire and expectations in a way that most feminists could only dream of. They take something that makes them uncomfortable in the second layer world and make it a badge of honor in the third layer. They could be anything in the third layer. A hulking space marine, an enormous samurai with all the power their bodies could give them, but instead they play themselves in clothing that would otherwise shame them, performing feats of strength and agility that audiences would only ever accept from a guy if he were built like the rock. Instead of accepting the humiliation of the first layer, or the exploitation of the second, they truly own their existence in the third. If you're rolling your eyes at this, thinking that this is a guy who's trying to explain away sexism, please note the previous segment was written by a good friend of mine who happens to be a woman. She's also one of the coolest people I know. Unfortunately, she doesn't like Man of Steel, but eh, nobody's perfect. So anyway, even though Snyder's put out four solidly entertaining and successful films, the internet community labels him a hack and one of the worst directors ever, due to one film that they either didn't see, didn't like, or didn't understand. Ignoring the out-of-left-field internet woes, Warner Brothers hires Snyder to direct the Superman reboot, Man of Steel. This was no easy task, but considering Snyder had previously done two successful comic book movies, Warner Brothers felt that he was the right man for the job. Now, audiences in general know Superman's origins, so instead of rewriting everything, they just took the basics and told them from a slightly different perspective. They weren't doing a darker take on Superman, or making Superman another Batman. They were just reintroducing the character, and how differently he'd be perceived in today's world. Instead of going over the making of the film like I usually do, I want to do something a little bit different this time. Social media and various forums have been complaining about Man of Steel for the past year, and I want to take some time to address those complaints. Heavy spoilers coming in, so tune out if you haven't seen the movie yet. So let me address some of these things. Superman finds the scout ship on Earth, and conveniently, it has his suit. Clearly you missed the part where he used his command key on the ship, which allowed him to create his own clothes with his family crest. Why did Pa Kent tell Clark it was okay to let some of the kids die to protect his identity? He never said that. He said maybe. What was I supposed to do? Just let him die? Maybe. What he was trying to instill in Clark was that sometimes, because of his abilities, he would have to make some tough decisions. He also wanted to make sure the world didn't find out about him before he was ready. When the world finds out what you can do, it's going to change everything. Our, our beliefs, our notions of what it means to be human, everything. Why did Clark destroy that guy's truck? That was not very fitting for his character. There's a reason why this movie was called Man of Steel and not Superman. In this movie, he's not Superman yet. This was his origin, him growing up and becoming Superman. Clark's made mistakes, he's not perfect. I'm sure we've all done stupid things when we were younger. Imagine how much dumber they'd be if you had superpowers. What was with all the religious undertones? You must have never seen anything with Superman before. Superman has always had religious themes. Some subtle, some not so subtle. As for him going to talk to a priest instead of jor this was just another layer showing that he was identifying with humans who he spent the past 30 years with. Pa Kent's death was stupid. Superman would have saved him. Superman, possibly. But Clark? No. Pa Kent knew he was going to die, and he died doing what he thought was right. He was protecting his son. In that scene, Pa Kent locked eyes with his son and told him not to rescue him. He knew that in that moment, if he looked away, Clark would have flew over there and it would have changed his life forever. While the scene went on for about a minute or so for dramatic tension, in actuality, the whole event was probably only a few seconds. Clark did nothing, obeying his father's wish, and it haunted him for the rest of his life. This'll come back later. Why didn't Superman use his breath, super speed, heat vision, etc. during various parts of the film? This is a problem with a character that has this much history. The audience knows what he can do, but the actual character in the movie doesn't. Clark had only recently discovered some of his abilities, so he still has to learn how to control them, which they showed in part with him learning to fly. Let me put it to you this way. Let's say someone gives you a sword. Are you all of a sudden a master swordsman? Sure, you could hurt someone with it, but in order to have control over it properly, you'd need training. The fight at the end was too gratuitous. So two titans get into a fight in the middle of a major city and destroy most of their surroundings with little regard for what's around them. Oh wait, I'm sorry. I was just describing Pacific Rim. I don't think that dragging a boat down the middle of a busy street and smashing monsters into buildings is showing much concern for the people around them. I'm not saying that Pacific Rim is bad, I'm just pointing out the double standard. 
You can't say the destruction in Pacific Rim was awesome, but it was gratuitous in Man of Steel. It's one thing if you just don't like the movie, it's another if you're being a hypocrite. In Justice League Unlimited, Superman launches Darkseid through buildings and destroys parts of the city, but no one complained about that. Why didn't Superman save the humans? He did when he could. However, most of the time he was trying to not get himself killed. Again, he's new to these powers. For 30 years, he's been the strongest being on the planet, but now along comes three people who match his strength, and one of them is a battle-hardened military commander. I was bred to be a warrior, Cal. Trained my entire life to master my senses. Where did you train? On a farm? That leads into the big brawl. Clark and Zod going head to head. This was made to look like a knockdown, drag out bar brawl between two gods. As far as Superman leaving Metropolis to take the fight elsewhere, Zod made it clear that that wasn't going to happen. Feora even tells him that their intention is to kill every human on Earth. You will not win. For every human you save, we will kill a million more. In the Avengers, New York was being destroyed. Why didn't they just take the fight elsewhere? Because they couldn't. Same thing here. And of course the big one, Superman killing Zod. Superman absolutely, positively never kills. Except when he does. In Superman number one, he throws a man off a cliff. In Superman number two, he destroys a munitions facility and kills everyone inside. In the same issue, Superman rather sadistically lets a terrorist choke to death on poison gas. He even taunts the guy as he's dying. But that was the old Superman. Let's move ahead a bit. In Action Comics 583, he murders Mr. Mixie's Plitlick. In Superman 75, he kills Doomsday. In Superman 82, he kills Hank Henshaw, whose consciousness was in the cyborg. In Justice League 22, he kills Dr. Light by melting his head. What about when he killed the Joker? That's just in the comics. What are some other examples? In the Adventures of Superman TV show, some guys find out Superman's identity and try to blackmail him. So Superman leaves them on the top of a mountain, where they fall to their death. In the last episode of Season 7 of Smallville, Clark kills Brainiac. In Superman 4, he drops Nuclear Man into a power plant, which kills him. In Superman Returns, when Superman sends the continent into space, he kills many of Lex's henchmen that are still on the surface of the thing. Never kills. This wasn't even the first time he killed Zod. In Superman 22, Superman killed Zod and the two other inmates that escaped from the Phantom Zone. Then in Superman 2, Superman strips Zod and the others of all their powers. This is worse than what he does in Man of Steel, because Zod is now powerless and at his mercy. What does he do? He breaks his hand and throws him off a cliff into the freezing Arctic waters. Non falls to his death, and Lois punches Ursa into the depths as well. But I guess it's okay because they joke about it. You're a real pain in the neck. With Clark killing Zod in Man of Steel, it had to happen. Zod had lost everything and made it clear to Clark that he would not stop until the Earth was dead. And now, I have no people. My soul. That is what you have taken from me. There was no kryptonite, no prison on Earth could hold him, and no more Phantom Zone. Zod would not Stop. When Superman was holding him and Zod was using his heat rays, why didn't he just cover them with his hand? Because Zod was as strong as him, and that would only serve to burn his hand and loosen his grip. Try grabbing a hot pan. What do you do? You drop the pan. Superman would have let go, and Zod would have went off to kill more people. Going back to Pa Kent's death, Clark did nothing and lost his father. Now he knew he had to do something, or he would lose everything else he cared about. He then did what he had to do, a choice he didn't take lightly. You want a reason why Superman doesn't kill? Here's your reason. He not only killed Zod to save the lives of countless people on Earth, but in doing so, he was killing the only other connection he had to his people. He didn't just kill the guy and then smirk about it. He was genuinely affected by it. He didn't want to do this, but he had no other choice. People complained about this too. He just went through an incredible ordeal. Of course he would have an emotional outpouring. What should he have done? Get up, make a snide comment, and fly Lois back to the fortress for a solid super dicking? Humans just flew a jet into the other ship, killing all the passengers, both human and Kryptonian. That's okay, but Superman killing Zod is bad? What's that say about humanity? Humans are allowed to be imperfect, but Superman's not? I understand that the first Superman is considered the better movie, but Superman can fly around the world backwards, which reverses time. That's okay. But him snapping the neck of a madman bent on destroying all life on Earth is the worst thing ever? 
Besides, you're confusing this with Batman. He's the one with the no-kill clause. And even he's killed. He did nothing to stop Two-Face from hanging himself. He even joked about it. And how about all the people that Batman killed in the first two Burton Batman films? Why wasn't anyone up in arms about that? The movie shows the growth of Clark, and how he's coming to grip with where he's from, where he is now, and where he's going to be in the future. It's the step that takes him from Clark to becoming Superman. The people were afraid of him, but now are learning to approach him. That's why this line, even though it is cheesy, makes sense. What are you smiling about, Captain? Nothing, sir. I just think he's kind of hot. Anyway, there's a difference between disliking a film and purposely looking for things to nitpick. Personally, I love the film and look forward to where they're going with it. I rank it really high up there as one of the best superhero films. So this isn't the Superman you grew up with. But you know what? The Superman 78 wasn't the one your parents or grandparents grew up with either. Should the character not be allowed to evolve because of how you think he should act? That he should remain exactly like he is in the comics? If that was the case, he'd still be a misogynistic prick that kills without conscience and frequently belittles those around him. Not exactly truth justice in the American way. If you hate the movie and feel the need to comment about how much you hate the movie, just realize that you're getting upset about a guy who flies around in blue and red spandex, enjoys being a jerk, and spanks his girlfriend for being lippy.